and let me welcome you to the fourth of the Blue Deal debates where we discuss issues affecting the fishing industry and our seas and our marine environment. I'm Chris Davis and this webinar is brought to you thanks to the Wood Pedersen Consultancy, Wood Pedersen Public Affairs in Brussels, for whom I'm very, very grateful indeed. And today we're looking at biodiversity because last week the European Commission adopted its biodiversity strategy and its farm to fork strategy. And uh, in the diversity strategy, it said, uh, this is a comprehensive and ambitious plan to protect nature and reverse the degradation of ecosystems. Nature is in crisis, the Commission said. It's disappearing in front of our eyes. Or in the case of the Blue Deal debate, it's disappearing beneath the waves because we're concerned about the marine environment. Now, with me to discuss the proposals, we have the current Director General of DG Mary, that's the European Commission's Fisheries Division. Uh, that's uh, Bernhard Fries. Uh, thank you very much for joining us, Bernhard. You're calling, I think, in from, from Brussels. Uh, making a second appearance on a Blue Deal webinar, we have Daniel Boses from uh, the Managing Director of, of Europesh, the, the voice of the fishing industry, dialing in from Madrid and um, coming in from somewhere near Lisbon, I think, Monica. We have Monica Verbeek, the Executive Director of Seas at Risk, the Environment NGO. Now, I'm sure we're going to have a lively exchange. Uh, if you watching wish to dial in with a question or a comment told somewhere down on the right hand side, there's an opportunity to, to do that. Uh, we may reach some of the questions during the course of our one hour, but if not, the participants have agreed to stay on for an extra half hour to, to look at those questions and, and try and come up with some answers. So thank you all. Let me turn now um, to Bernhard. Um, Director General, DG Mary, you're responsible for the fisheries part, uh, the marine part of the biodiversity strategy. Looking at it, uh, it, it, it's a plan, an idea, a communication with 2030 as its aim. What differences do you hope to make by 2030? Bernard, I think you need to turn on your microphone. No, we've not. We've not got you. Um, we're, we're, yeah, we're still waiting for uh, for some uh, uh, for a bit. I'll, while you look around at that, I'm going to go to Monica. Assuming you can hear me, Monica. I just uh, just explore that word crisis. I mean, the Commission said there is a crisis. Now, we're concerned about the seas, not simply the, 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 the land situation. Is there a crisis? Well, there's absolutely a crisis. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can perfectly. Thank you. Good. Uh, then I confirmed there's a crisis. It's not just um, a commission or NGO saying that. It. It's scientists. Uh, they published an IPES report pointing out that uh, we are in the midst of a six uh, mass extinction. Uh, there's an IPCC report uh, showing the enormous impact climate, uh, uh, the climate crisis already has on the ocean. Um, and um, it's clear that uh, especially marine uh, biodiversity is um, declining very, very rapidly. So yes, we're in a crisis. Well, when you say marine diversity is, uh, biodiversity is declining, and yet fish stocks uh, in European seas, especially the Atlantic, are, are looking in rather a good state. Uh, some fish stocks are indeed improving the state of some fish stocks, uh, but uh, biodiversity is not just fish. Biodiversity is everything. It's the ecosystems in which the, the fish need in order to survive and thrive. It's the whole uh, ecos the biodiversity of all the uh, organisms in the sea that we need in our fight against the climate crisis. So it's much wider than just uh, fisheries. Though the IPBES report was very uh, clear that um, um, that uh, um, fisheries is one of the main drivers of the current biodiversity decline in 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 the sea. Sorry, our fishing our fishing activity. Yeah. is one of the main yes. the biodiversity plan. Okay, Bernhard, how are we doing? Have we got uh, other technical problems sorted out? Can you hear me? No, we still, we, we still have no, uh, we still can't hear, hear you. Um, I'm hoping um, perhaps our technical people can, can contact you. Um, 
Uh, and I'm going to have to go on to, to Daniel because there you are, Daniel. You've just been told that the, uh, the fishing industry is responsible for the decline in biodiversity in, to a significant degree. You are presumably going to say this is not entirely true. Yes, this is not entirely true at all. Uh, yeah, we are really used to these uh, messages conveying a message of massive extinction of the oceans that is not happening to you. I mean, I'm, I'm challenging anyone in the audience to tell me one single species in the European Union in the marine environment that has disappeared. There's none, nothing. And actually, the situation of the fish is improving. I mean, the, yes, true is uh, we have 50% more, more fish at sea in only 10 years. Overfishing is an all-time low, and almost 100% of the e of the landings from EU-managed stocks in the North East Atlantic come from MSY stocks. So MSY MSY is maximum sustainable yield, being yeah. fished sustainably. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry for not specifying. So um, we don't see the uh, this 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 issue when we talk about uh, biomass. This 50% is about biomass. It's not just for certain fish stocks. It's that we have global po populations increasing even by catch stocks and uh, for us i mean the uh, actually the uh, the strategy is actually discriminatory because uh, yes it's true we have identified a lot of threats to, to nature and to the environment uh, like pollution climate change uh, alien species over exploitation etc but then the only sector to blame is fishing where are the rest if you read the strategy and i encourage you to look for the words oil gas dredging, aquaculture, shipping, they are not even there. Just look for this word and it's not there. And they have a massive carbon footprint, they displace animals, they disrupt ecosystems, and they are not even mentioned in the strategy. So for us, this strategy is window dressing, trying to greenwash the image of the European Union through fisheries restrictions. And it's really sad that the European Union is not acknowledging the huge efforts that we have done as European fishing industry so far, and the huge good results that we have achieved. So we don't see anything of anything of this in this strategy. And well, actually, just give me one more second. The commissioner, he has a strong mandate, and I quote, to draw on the potential of sustainable seafood as low carbon food source. So the commission under the Green Deal, he has to recognize fishing and, and fish as a low carbon food uh, protein. So where is this in the in the text? We only read restrictions and limitations and prohibitions, but we do not see the uh, the contribution of uh, fishing to to food security or anything of the sort. Oh, thank you. Uh, I, I must have, Bernhard, can you uh, can you hear me now? I can hear you. Very good. Well, you just heard Daniel there having. Uh, you had Monica spelling out the problem of the crisis. You had Daniel saying this report is all strategy, is all greenwash, it's an attack upon the fishing industry. And yet, uh, obliquely there, he's uh, giving praise to the European Commission because he says in the past 10 years, fish stocks have hugely recovered. So you must have been doing something right. What, what more do you want to do right over the next 10 years? I'm happy to hear that uh, to start with. Uh, <laughs> I also agree with what Monica said. Um, um, I, I think what this policy does is really acknowledge, um, perhaps for the first time um, at that level, the scale of the of the challenge we face, right? I mean, you know, you, you asked about 2030, and um, we have to, we really have to make a turnaround by 2030. And it's it's the dual crisis, it's it's the climate crisis, and it's the biodiversity crisis. I, if, if, if we just look at the wider picture, in, in, in both in both aspects, we are approaching tipping points that will take us as a society, as, 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 as humanity, to a point where there's no return anymore. It's very clear. Huh? Whether it's the, the methane release in the Arctic, whether it's uh, disappearance of, of insects, uh, it is, I think, hugely encouraging that this commission has the, the leadership, the political leadership, to put this on the table at, at this point of time, because this is vital. Eh? We live through a crisis now, but the crisis we live through now is, is small compar in comparison to what we might see coming if we don't take action quickly. So I think that's, that's very important. And I, I do believe that the marine environment has to play its role and we have to protect it better in the future. I think that is, that is true. I, I, I don't agree that this is greenwashing. I think it is a very, very serious attempt, not only to do the right thing, to understand that the environment is part of our living space, right? It's not just a luxury, it's part of our living space, 
but it's also part of, of our economic, social well-being uh, as a society. Now, on 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 fisheries, you're right, Daniel is right. We have made huge progress. I'm really happy to hear that because you know we have made that progress over the last ten years. Uh, sometimes with a lot of resistance, and, and to yeah, see that this has changed. Uh, so so we, still, we still hear time after time that um, you know Europe's overfishing and we're doing terrible things. But in a relatively short period of time, that the commercial fish stocks have recovered very well indeed, and you know all, all credit to everyone concerned. They have recovered, and you know some of them have not recovered. And let's be honest, uh, there are areas like in the Mediterranean where we have to do much, much more, much more, right? But we. It shows that if we set ourselves targets, and we set ourselves a 10 year target 10 years ago, and we, we kind of partly reached it, at least in the Atlantic, in the northern waters, you can do it. If you focus on that, you can do it. And you need to keep working on it continuously and with a lot of energy and determination, but you can do it. I think that is the message, and that's, I think, the philosophy that we want to see in this, in this biodiversity strategy as well. Thank you. Well, look, just to, to uh, come over to the, the details here. This is a communication, it's a, a broad brushstroke, and it refers specifically to the Commission coming forward with uh, proposals for binding nature restoration targets with clear targets and with clear targets and timelines next year sometime. So does that mean there's going to be specific legislation calling for the measures to be taken that will affect our, our seas and our marine environment? It's actually... Um... A, um, if you read the document, um, you know, everybody talks about the 30% the target and the 10% target and targets. And But if you read the document that the Commission adopted, and this is really based on a lot of work and a lot of scrutiny, what can we do, what can't we do, what is possible, what's achievable, what not, you see a very logical and concrete agenda in there. Yeah? So we, will, we are going to start working this year, as of now, with member states to designate protected areas, for instance. Uh, we will put out guidance on what it means concretely, not just in abstract, but concretely to have strictly strictly protected areas. Uh, there will be nature restoration plans, there will be legislation on that, there will be work with member states and with uh, many players uh, on applying the existing legislation better and, and more effectively. Uh, it needs to be an inclusive process. If, if we have one is, is that we need to speak to to the stakeholders and we can involve them you have to take them with you right and well, this 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 needs to be done well here, here we have you know you want to bring the fishing industry with you and so far uh, you know we've not got off to a, a great start can i just say though that there was a biodiversity strategy when i was elected to the european parliament back in 1999 and it said we would halt and reverse the decline by 2010 and then when we got nearer to 2010 we said right we'll halt and reverse the decline by 2020 now we're talking about 2030. So, so what's different? I mean, how, why do you think this strategy is going to make a difference when previous ones have not? What's different? The sense of urgency, I think. Um, I think there is, all of us, there's no exception, I think. We all of us realize that this is probably our last bite at the, at the bullet. We have to, we really have to, we really have to get it right this time. Um, and it can be done. And I would like to come back to what, what Daniel said. The fisheries policy shows that you can actually set yourself targets and then achieve them afterwards. If you hardwire them into legislation, if you have the right tools, if you make sure that you do it in a process that will meet resistance, no doubt, but takes that takes basically all those who have a stake in it with you, then you can actually do it, right? So it's no reason to be pessimistic. I think it is possible. It will require a big effort, I think. Well, Monica, you heard Daniel say that um, you know, no, no fish stocks, no species has been wiped out. No one can name anything. I mean, you were talking about the extent of the crisis, but you've got to rebut that. I mean, the, the fishing industry will be saying things are not as bad as, as people are indicating. We can continue in the way we are. I'm assuming, Daniel, I'm putting words in your mouth here, but I'm assuming that is what you're, you're saying. Monica, is that is that realistic? I mean, do you think the fishing industry has to change? Yes, fishing industry has to change. They have already uh, done several very good steps, obviously. Um, but what is needed and what is also becoming very clear out of the biodiversity strategy is there's a need uh, to shift to low impact fishing. Um, um, we have uh, tackled now in the, or we are still tackling, we're absolutely not there. Uh, but we have made some progress in the Northeast Atlantic in ending overfishing. But that is just one aspect of, of the impacts that fisheries have on the environment. Uh, there are uh, certain types of fisheries that, that, that see um, uh, huge impacts on the bottom. 
uh, carbon storage uh, ecosystems being uh, mulled up uh, because of uh, bottom trawling. Uh, there are uh, huge bycatches. Again, this, this winter, uh, a lot of bycatch, uh, 1,400 dolphins. Last year, it was assessed at 11,000 dolphins as bycatch in the Bay of Biscay in uh, trawling and gill netting. Uh, clearly, there are still things that need urgent attention. The, the, the dolphin bycatch is really now an emergency and, and requires emergency measures. So there's still lots of room for um, uh, improvement. And um, um, the only way we can, we can get that improvement is to make sure that there are places indeed where nature can be restored actively by really uh, putting in new oyster beds or passively by not having any human activities there. Um, uh, but other than that, also all other human activities and, and mind you, in the biodiversity strategy, um, there are other <laughs> activities that have a huge impact on the sea that are mentioned. Uh, like uh, uh, extraction, uh, but also um, uh, agriculture, which has, of course, also a huge impact on the sea. Yeah. And of course, fisheries and agriculture are also addressed in the farm to fork strategy. It is a, it's 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 about trying, trying to stop pollution from, from nitrates and phosphorus fertilizers and uh, insecticides yeah. and the like. Yeah. But I, uh, coming back to what I was saying, uh, reducing the impact of the fisheries can be addressed by reducing the amount of fish taken out and by uh, fishing in an other way uh, which has less impact on the environment and there are very clear examples of how to do that but surely I mean, i'll come to you daniel but surely perhaps monica you should, you should just reply to this though that they used the fish stocks used to be you know 50 years ago much greater than they are now um we've overfished now we've turned a corner stocks seem to be seems to be coming coming back up i mean you just sort of said that we should be taking less fish out Surely the fish, for the fishing industry and for the sake of people's health, you know, we should be eating more fish. I mean, the fishing industry should have a bright future because our stock should recover and the industry should be able to take more fish out of the seas. So yeah. you're asking me if the, if yeah, the fish... Yeah, yeah, well, I'm asking you, I'll, I'll come on to Daniel, but, but um, I mean, you, you, you suggested to me that we, I think you suggested just then that we should be taking even less fish. But if the fish stocks are recovering, why should we do that? Well, first of all, we, we, we are not there yet. The fish stocks are not recovering, uh, have not recovered yet. There's still um, a massive amount to do there. And let's not be uh, too, too pleased with ourselves and stop looking at something before we have achieved it. Um, but other than that, you can indeed uh, uh, wonder what it does. I think what is the main gain of this biodiversity strategy is that um, not unlike the uh, um, um, birds and habitats uh, directives, it is not looking at separate species or habitats, it's really looking at ecosystems, right, at the biodiversity. And um, fish are only a, a part of that. So if you want to have a healthy and thriving uh, ocean with, with, with healthy ecosystems that is uh, um, capable of um, addressing the climate crisis of having a little bit more resilience, you should not go to the utter, utter, utmost amount of fish you can take out all the time. You really have to give it a bit of uh, uh, extra, a bit of space. If you look at, at the impacts of uh, re really no-take zones in NPAs on uh, fish populations, there is a, a much larger abundance. And yes, if there's a much, much larger abundance, you can probably take out a bit more without impacting the environment. The question is, do we really need that? because right now the average fish consumption in Europe is already exceeding uh, the uh, um, advice. So why would we eat more fish if that's not really uh, necessary? Well, uh, perhaps to give jobs to fishermen, but so let's, <laughs> so let's, uh, let's Yeah, but wait to, a minute. No, I, I really, would like, to, I really would like to jump on the, this very quickly because um, uh, giving jobs to fishermen is not only by taking more and more fish out, it's taking uh, out in a better way fish. You can really uh, still have lots of jobs in the fishing industry. Right now, there's not much equity. There's, there's millionaires in the fishing industry and there's people just scraping by for sure uh, subsistence, uh, like in many sectors. Uh, so th there can be some redivision there. If you go to low impact fisheries, I'm not saying that, or if you are not going to take out more and more fish, doesn't have to mean that you will have less and less jobs. Absolutely not. What you have to look at is um, 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 the way uh, fishing can 
um, be of less impact and still uh, provide uh, sufficient jobs. And oh, perhaps, yeah. and perhaps yeah. accept that indeed some fishermen will have to diverge into uh, other sectors. But if the fish is being paid for the quality that will no, less, uh, no doubt be much better if you have a nephrops caught by a creel or by a trawler, right. everybody um, would have pay more right. for the creel one. Well, here you can. Daniel, I'm going to come on back, back onto you. Now, I heard a lot of what Monica has just said, because the, the, you know, the, the, the industry, the big voice of the industry is the, is the powerful players, the, the, if you like the, the millionaires, you know, the big companies. But, um, and I just wondered, you know, those companies are making big profits now, or, or were before the virus hit. I mean, record profits, I think Bernard has argued in the past. Um, as we look to the, the future, is the fishing industry simply going to be saying, you know, that all the wildlife documentaries that people see across Europe which suggest that the biodiversity of our seas is declining. Do you, are you just simply going to say that that is wrong? Are you simply going to oppose, oppose everything? Because surely the, the measures that the Commission and the European Union has introduced over the past few years, not all of which by any means have been supported by the fishing industry, have actually led to a much better situation. Can't, why are you not going along finding, finding ways of saying, yes, we want a strong fishing industry, but we also want a really healthy ecosystem. Yeah, I um, I really think that the problem lies with the utilization of uh, global statistics in the European context. So the problem is that the European Commission is uh, um, trying to prove that we have this massive extinction in the European Union, but the problem lies with the management in other countries, like for instance in Asian countries, they really have a problem and they really need to adopt strong measures. But I don't think that is true for the European Union context. And we just need to look at the results. They work. And they, we need to continue investing in these measures, in expanding fisheries management, in making sure that all member states are applying the same rules in the same manner to achieve the same goals. And that should be the, the way forward. I mean, we are not opposing to, to more legislation, but we want rational and proportionate uh, rules. Otherwise, we're just going to face another crisis that uh, not, not just even with the COVID, but if we are restricting fishing in the European Union by 30%, then we have to face Brexit, then we have to face more environmental standards, uh, then we need to face also the wind farms all over the seas. Where are we going to fish? And how is this good for the environment? How is this good for the uh, food security? I mean, you're talking about this, uh, this crisis in nature, but we need to bear in mind that uh, we're going to top 8.5 billion citizens in the in the world by 2030 now that you like all these uh, global estimates what are they going to eat if we are reducing fishing pressure in the european union and why we should do that because it's working i mean what we're doing now is working so the european union should produce should uh, 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 focus on how to produce more seafood in a sustainable manner rather than further closing traditional fishing areas because reducing productivity in the european union would mean that we need to import more from third countries, which are far, really far away from the European environmental and social standards. And in light of this disruption of the COVID, we cannot risk further reduction of our fisheries. Uh, otherwise, what are we going to eat? I mean, it's true, we need energy, we need uh, tourism and everything, but then in reality, uh, and then I would like to come back to the bottom trolling. Uh, yeah, we'll come. We'll, we'll come back on the bottom trawling. If I may, Daniel, it's a sort of a separate issue. But Hart, um, Daniel's just said that uh, the fishing industry wants uh, rational and proportionate measures from the Commission. I'm, I'm sure the Commission always takes rational and proportionate measures, doesn't it? It does. It does. The answer is yes. <laughs> no, we know. Elaborate on that. <laughs> okay. Okay. And, and, um, just nice goals, good for the tweet, good for the health. It does. No impact. Well, let me, let me, the let me, question let me. is, oh, please. Please the go question ahead. is whether we have the same understanding of what is necessary, proportionate and uh, and effective. Um, but uh, I, if I may, um, I am a bit worried that we are falling back into a rather stereotypical debate uh, on issues that have been discussed and traded for you know for years. Uh, um, if, if you ask me, what are the main stressors on the marine environment? I think fisheries is one of them, no doubt, but it's not the only one. It's not the only one. Eh? The main stressor is, is warming, acidification. I think it's a huge problem. Eh? We stand to lose globally 25% of marine life simply by the coral reefs dying, and probably unavoidably. Uh, with a two degree increase in temperature, 
basically all our coral reefs are gone. Um, secondly, the, the, the really big problem I see in some of our European waters is pollution and its nutrients in the water. I'm really happy that we managed, and I will not go into the in internal details, but it took a lot of discussion to set ourselves a target for uh, fertilizers and nutrient inflows into sea by 2030. It's very important. If we look to the Baltic Sea, we can see that uh, a lot of the oxygen is gone. Uh, fish can't feed anymore because of that, because of agriculture, essentially. So it's we have to go back from, from these kind of stereotypes into the broader picture. The broader picture is that agriculture is as part of the picture as urban urban wastewater is as part of the picture as as uh, as fisheries and other things. Let me just if stop you there. But let me just stop you there. Don't address right? these. I just, want to, I, just, I, I just want to stop you because I take it uh, both Monica and Daniel would agree with you on on, on the uh, the need to stop nutrients pollution of, the, of our seas. You you agree, Daniel? I do. This I is something where the, so the, fish, the fishing industry and the European Commission are united. I take it the environmental NGOs are, are with you too. So so this is a battle. I mean, you'll you have a you'll have a battle with the farmers and the the fertilizer companies, no doubt. But, we uh, always look for consensus. Okay, well, that's a that's a that's a that's a, a good point. Now, I want to turn on to NPAs. That's marine protected areas in a, okay. in a moment. Um, in fact, we better start now because we're not quite at halfway point yet. Um, marine protected areas. Um, the Commission is, is is saying that you should expand the areas of the sea uh, covered by NPAs to thirty percent. I think of the of of the of the European, am I getting the words right? The European uh, seabed. Um, currently, it's at about eleven or twelve percent. But I really don't know what an MPA is, what a marine protected area is, because it seems to me that trawling takes place. And I, I don't know where the protection is. I've heard the commissioner talk about paper protection, not proper protection, before now. I mean, how many of the Bernard? How many of the that, what is a, what is an MPA supposed to be and what fishing activity is supposed to be allowed to take place in it? And what's the reality? The reality is that if we're honest with ourselves, um, as successful we have been, uh, at least in big areas, on, on fishing pressure, on fishing effort, on meeting sustainable tar stability targets. When it comes to MPAs, we have to be honest, we have to do more. Eh? There's a lot to catch up. Uh, so this is important. This is important, and I think a big focus going forward will be on on uh, not only going to the thirty percent target, which, by the way, is the international uh, almost consensus now in the biodiversity con in the run up to the biodiversity convention, um, but also to make sure that the, these these MPAs, these protected areas, actually work. That they actually work, eh? and that is something that requires uh, a lot of investment into science looking at each situation, governance, uh, finding proper arrangements for proper management arrangements for protected areas, proper rules that need to be put in place by member states and locally, making sure that they are controlled, and very importantly, making sure that this is actually participative. Huh? If you want to create a, a really good, effective, protected area, and there are many, many areas where this is needed, you need to do it in a participative way. That's that's all the, the lessons we have. And unfortunately, I'm very honest here and very open. Unfortunately, this has not done as much as it should have been done until, until now. So I think this is a big challenge. It's a big task for the next years. OK, Monica, why is an area declared? Why is it identified by the scientists as something that should be protected? What makes it special? Well, depends a lot on uh, on. The, well, I'm getting now legalistic, but whether it is under the Birds and Habitat uh, Directive or under the Marine Strategy Framework Directive. But in general, it is because there are species or habitats uh, that are habitats very important for certain species that need protection. What is very good, as I said before, of this uh, biodiversity strategy is the recognition that in order to protect a species or a habitat, you need a healthy ecosystem. It's not they're not just alone. They, there's interactions. And by going to this strict protection now and making it very explicit, it's very clear that uh, uh, that we really need uh, restored ecosystems. Um, and an, and uh, a marine protected area should be there to, to make sure ecosystems are uh, protected. And of course, that differs a lot from area to area. What are the kind of measures that you need to be taking? But up to now, it is still for several or for many member states up to now, fisheries was not really something to be even looked at. 
in a marine protected area, whether it should be regulated or not. We have been having many uh, discussions with uh, member state governments to explain and point out to them, no, actually fisheries is a measure that falls under the habitat directive, that something needs to be done about this. And um, so I'm very glad that it's now also very explicitly <coughs> recognized that fisheries measures need to be taken in marine protected areas. Look, we're at the halfway point now of this Blue Deal debate. So just for those watching, I'd just like to thank you for joining us. Uh, we're taking part as a result of the support of the Russell's consultancy, Good Pedersen Public Affairs, for, which I'm, for whom I'm, who support for whom I'm enormously grateful. Um, now, if you know of people who can't actually watch this webinar live, then please understand that uh, it, you can get a repeat. Uh, I think either by pressing the registration button at some point at the end of the programme or it'll be on YouTube as from tomorrow afternoon. If you want to ask a question, make a comment, then I'm told uh, you can do that by uh, looking at the column on the right hand side and our participants will be uh, dealing with those on the hour for uh, a half hour session specifically to look at questions. Now we're discussing the European Commission's biodiversity strategy for 2030, which was published last Wednesday. Uh, and with us, we have the current Director General of DG Murray, Bernard Priest. We have uh, the Managing Director of Europesh, the fishing industry, uh, Daniel Voses. And from Lisbon, we have um, Monica Verbeek uh, from Seas at Risk, Exec Executive Director of Seas at Risk. So thank you once again. We are discussing uh, marine protected areas, MPAs. Daniel, um, we have these MPAs. I mean, the Commission is calling for them to be increased to 30% of the sea area. They're currently about 11 or 12%. But as far as I can see, you know, there's, there's very little protection. I mean, trawling, trawling of the seabed takes place in most of them. So I don't understand. What does the fishing industry understand by a protected area? What does it want to, to protect? Or why is it not doing so? I agree with Bernard when he said that we need uh, marine protected areas based on scientific advice to achieve uh, uh, good results, to be effective. And we should do this to really protect the marine environment, not to reach a quota or to reach a percentage. So what we see in the European Union is that we have the target nowadays uh, up to 10% of MPAs and they are not working. And they are not working because MPAs, they are not the panacea for all ocean problems. They are far from it. They are management tools like many others, like fisheries management. And MPAs, as it was uh, in, the, in, in, the, in the sea, they are inefficient against IUU, acidification, pollution, or plastics. This is uh, runoff pollution that is coming from, from land, and there's nothing you can do without MPA to prevent this. And what about the cost of displacement? Because you're going to kick out 30%, uh, within this 30%, you're gonna kick out all the vessels from this area to another area. <laughs> And also many MPAs, they are failing to achieve their goals. We and this of, this of course creates a dangerous solution of protection. Uh, because as, as proven, for instance, by a recent study, one of the largest MPAs, most MPAs in the Indian Ocean declared in 2010, is the size of France, has shown no evidence of a spillover effect on tuna stocks. Also, we have another example in Palau's Marine Sanctuary, the size of Spain, that bad by it because now the, the uh, local population is consuming reef fish instead of tuna. So this demonstrates that both biodiversity and food security they are better served by expanding effective fisheries management and not by establishing more marine sanctuaries. Okay, let me, let me turn to Bernard there. Bernard, um, you've just talked about, you've just heard Daniel refer to the so-called spillover effect, by which he means that you know, when you have a marine protected area, in theory, the fish stocks are going to recover and that means there's going to be more fish for the, for the fishermen all around, everyone benefits. But he's suggesting that's not, that's not the case. Well, we don't, we, don't, we don't see it in that case, but we see it with fisheries management. I mean, 50% more fish in the sea. What else do we want? That's it. Well, so Bernard, defend the reason why you're proposing that the, the uh, area of the sea protected by MPA designation should be increased from the current 10 or 11 percent to 30 percent. Why should we do that? Who benefits? I'm a bit worried about the um, the argument what else do we want? want? Um, I, I, if we have shown by 
by engaging in sustainable management that we can and indeed we have that we can increase the size of, of the fish stocks by 50 percent and we have done that and by the way create significant economic benefits for the fishing industry as well as well then the the logical conclusion for me is not now we can stop and what else do we want the logical conclusion is what else can we do and and if you look if you if you transfer that logic onto the marine protected areas i I'm going to put in the chat afterwards the link to a really beautiful little study that we did uh, just a year ago, which analyzes on a case by case basis the, the, some of the marine protected areas that exist already, and it analyzes the economic benefit that you derive from that. So not only is it good for um, protecting carbon capture, enabling carbon capture, spawning areas for fish, all the marine flora that, that there is that, that is part of the ecosystem as well all the ecosystem services that you that that the sea can provide much more it's also good for the for the local people it's good for the local economy actually it's good for fishermen uh, the experience shows that um, if you if you increase the biomass in areas it spills over indeed um, but it's also good for the wider economic environment because you have new forms of tourism you have less seasonal tourism you have more quality tourism you have more hotel beds occupied etc cetera, etc cetera. all these things come in uh, it's it's quite interesting actually if you look at concrete examples. So let's get out of this this mentality that we have done enough and and now we can stop. I think we should build on the successes we have and do more actually. And I think that is what we are going to do. Well, what do you propose the trawling, for example, to come onto the subject which Daniel was was uh, raising before? I mean, there are suggestions here in the in the commission strategy that uh, bottom seabed bottom trawling should be restricted. Um, that is, Bernard, that, that is your proposal, is it? That will be your proposal? It is not what it says. And uh, if you actually read the text, it is quite nuanced. Uh, but it is true that uh, fishing gear that touches the sea bottom is an issue in, in that context. Eh? And if you, look at, uh, if you look at how to expand, how to you know, intensify our management in marine protected areas, and we will do that, um, it, that needs to be part of the that is the part of the story. So we need to so look at uh, how uh, touches the sea bottom in different ways, huh? that all kind of different gears with their pros and cons, how that can be uh, managed uh, in uh, in protected areas. It's it's important. So Monica, why 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 do environmentalists um, have it in for bottom trawling? What damage allegedly does it do? Allegedly, well, there's zillions of studies showing what uh, uh, Dreadic trolling, uh, churning up the bottom uh, does to the ecosystem, to the benthic ecosystems, uh, to the carbon storage, uh, and also um, um, and to the wider uh, uh, ecosystem. The whole problem is uh, that if you churn up the bottom all the time, everything in there, what lives in there, dies, and it has to be uh, recovering. But it can't recover because uh, many areas are trolled three, four, twenty times a year. And um, and that means that you basically accept a, a huge, fast, dead areas in the sea because you want to have this specific fish. There are other ways to catch that fish, less invasive. And, and, and that's why we say, why don't you go there? And especially now that we are getting to a situation where fish stocks are recovering, it's all the more easier now to make that shift to low impact fishing because there's more fish. So you don't have to go to the very utter effort, the, the, the farthest away, etc., to get those fishes, you can actually uh, use uh, much less impacting gear to catch the same fish. So, so Daniel, obviously, you're going to have a right to reply, reply here. Um, I mean, bottom, bottom trawling, uh, scraping the seabed, allegedly. I mean, there must be some restrictions on it, must it not? Uh, Chris, I, I really need to comment on the uh, on the APA uh, study, uh, the, co the economic benefit of MPAs uh, for the fishing industry. Actually, I participated in that study, and the most significant uh, or the, the most successful example in this study for the fishing industry, they generated over a no-take MPA zone of 8 to 15 years, a net gain of plus 10%. So is that the best MPAs can do? And when, the, when uh, Bernard he was talking about the, uh, the social benefits, they, they actually MPAs, what they're doing is they increase competition over the same space by fishermen. And some of them, they will be kicked out. And nobody's talking about that. Now, um, 
it's strange for us that in MPAs and in the Cs, et cetera, we're talking about bottom trolling or bottom contacting years, but nobody's talking about wind farms. Actually, the commission is encouraging uh, the installation of wind farms everywhere, even in vulnerable areas. What happened? I mean, why are they so good for the environment and not just touching with the gear? Why drilling, building a whole installation and structure in the sea and uh, creating energy and, and uh, noise underwater? I invite you to attend the uh, meetings of the marine strategy. It's, 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 it's a diversionary tactic. Just explain to us why there should not be some restrictions on bottom drawing. Yes, there, there is there is a lot of restrictions. Bottom trolling is one of the most common, certified, regulated, I would say over-regulated, and research gears in the European Union. All right. And we must bear in mind that is the only gear that uh, with which we can uh, catch certain uh, important species such as Greenland halibut, Megrin and shrimps. They are all in MSY levels. And also trolling, they work in very limited areas. They don't they don't work everywhere in the sea. I mean, if we look at NEAF, for instance, the FFMO in the north of Europe, we only troll in 3% of the area. Is that too much? I don't think so. And we've been doing that for decades. So I mean, how is the commission going to convert 13,000 or 14,000 trollers that we have nowadays with the help of the EMFF to transition to what? And what are we going to fish? Are we going to fish for the same species with the same gears? I mean, we don't have extra funding now to, to face the COVID consequences. We wonder where the money will come from. So, I mean, for us, bottom trolling is like asking farmers not to plow. To be okay, but Bernhard, you're not, as, as you said, the proposal, the biodiversity trust is nuanced when it comes to um, bottom trawling, but uh, uh, you've heard the arguments of the defense, if you like. I take it you, you, you're still suggesting, you know, there, are, there needs to be some, some restrictions for the sake of protecting precious biodiversity. Uh, first of all, I, I don't believe, you know, I think we can, e we can e each of us throw around with percentages. If you look at the, at the North Sea, we don't look at, um, at 3%, we look at more in the region of 80% of some form of, some of, some form of bottom gear being used. Uh, so it's, it's, it depends very much where you look. And, and if you have the, the heavily fished areas, of course, the, the impact on the seabed is, is much, much bigger than, than, than some other areas. Um, like anything, you have to look at really the, the situations and you have to look at science. Huh? It, we are not saying that bottom gear is, is only bad and other gears are only good. Each gear has its environmental effects. If you fish with long lines, you might catch sharks, you might catch turtles. If you fish with traps and you have these lines, you have whales that might entangle in, in, in the lines. None of these things are good. So we have to minimize the bad effects of, of everything. But it is true, and when we look at marine protected areas and look at the North Sea, look at the Dogger Bank, we have this discussion right now. We will have to look at how to take out of off limits some areas, some protected uh, areas to be protected from 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 gear that that risks harming them or harms them. That I think is going to come, and I think it's a discussion we need to have in a very concrete way, right, in a very practical way, based on science, and if necessary, also with help from uh, the the Marine Fisheries Fund. But to say that you know things can continue as they are now, that is not the case. But this will only happen. I mean, you only get an MPA de declared, designated, and then the rules enforced if the the, the country, the member state uh, responsible for that area of the sea, um, is is thoroughly involved and puts in place the enforcement measures. I mean, the problem at the, is, the problem at the moment is they're not doing that, even the ones we have had declared. So again, the question is. Why is there going to be a difference now with this new strategy? So if you read the strategy, it sets out a program how to address member states and how to address uh, how to support them in actually designating new areas and uh, putting in place, you know, the rules that exist already, which, which are the EU environmental directives, essentially, to, to, to really protect these areas better. I think that's very important. You're right. Under the fisheries policy, we do have a certain weakness in that for a lot of the management measures, we depend on member states actually taking the initiative, doing it first themselves and agreeing amongst each other. Because if you look at a, a, a area like the, the North Sea, of course, it is not one member state. It is Germany, Denmark, UK, uh, Netherlands and so on, Norway. So they all need to agree. And only then can we take action and actually put this into EU measures. This is perhaps a weakness we have in the system, to be very frank. Yeah? And as we are going forward, as we're going perhaps into a review of 
whether the present rules work, we have to, I think, think about that. I think it's it's an important avenue to, to consider. Thank you. Just um, turning on to another point here, and this may, um, this may uh, extend, I think this is actually the farm to fork strategy, which was published at the same time as biodiversity. Um, and it said in that that the commission will seek commitments from food companies to take action on health and sustainability with legal action if, if this is insufficient. I mean, the, the, the retailers and the fish processing companies have the opportunity to make easily as much difference as any uh, lawmaking body can do, can they not? I mean, to what extent is the, are you all really engaged in, press, in working with the, the fish processing companies to say, look, you know, our customers want sustainability, we want more fish for the future, you know, we want top quality, but we all need to be working together in pressing for these things. We shouldn't have to have enforcement measures introduced to make it happen. To you, Bert, first of all, have you been working with the fish processing companies in this way, or is it an area where there's more opportunity? Uh, yes, we do. So um, I've been speaking to quite a number of retailers in the last months, um, and you know, including the big retail chains, Interestingly, they all have their own sustainability policy and they differ. Um, but if you go to a supermarket now, right, um, you find that a bit, many of them use labels and you use MSC and ASC labels and others. Uh, in France, you have, uh, again, different than Germany and so on. Um, what we plan to do is to take a fresh look at what we call the marketing standards, right? So at the moment, our European Union seafood marketing standards cover rather technical issues like how to package this and that seafood product. We will look at that and we will see whether we can introduce a proper sustainability standard so that when a, a caught fish or a farmed fish is, is put on the market, uh, the consumer can see from from on the basis of these standards, whether this is sustainable food or not. So that, that is the project, one of the projects we are putting forward in the farm to fork. Daniel, you, some of your members within the fishing industry you know, already get Marine Stewardship Council certification or some other label on the cans, you know, to, to, to say they're fishing in some particular way, and others don't. I mean, do you have a, do you, have, do you as, as Europesh have a view about certification and sustainable, you know, giving, indications of sustainability to the customers? Well, for us, uh, I do think, and I think uh, Bernard uh, agrees with me, that the, the European Union is the first uh, body on the national, that the governments that uh, need to secure that the fish that is marketed in the European Union is sustainable. And that we do that by uh, complying with the law. And uh, that is, I think that is the first step. Then on, on certification, MSC is one of the, uh, uh, the certifiers in uh, in the European Union and globally, but of course we have uh, many others. Uh, but we what we uh, need to have in the European Union is uh, marketing standards that ensure uh, that the fish is not uh, just compliant with uh, uh, hygiene rules, with uh, minimum size rules, etc. But also including the sustainability component, which also we can talk about uh, social sustainability. It was the fish uh, uh, fished by uh, fishermen working on good condition, so is it being imported by Southeast Asia with the slaves on board? That also needs to be uh, taken into consideration. We are okay. co collaborating within the Market Advisory Council with the whole chain, how to reduce uh, food waste, how to reduce uh, packaging, stimulate innovation. I think all of this is important uh, to be included for the future of farm to fork. And I think this is a really good strategy. As I mentioned in the beginning, the commissioner has a strong mandate uh, to push for a sustainable seafood because sustainable seafood has the lowest carbon footprint uh, compared with other animal production sectors. Monica, let's just turn to uh, everyone's favorite, which is dolphins. Um, everyone, everyone likes a dolphin. And, you know, last year, I think it was, um, some tens of thousands of dolphins were washed up dead on the coasts of the Bay of, the Bay of Biscay. I think there's a report about uh, the problem of, of, of uh, bycatch killing of cessations coming out just about this moment from, from a body of scientists. Um, yourself, I mean, what measures, what, what is the scale of the problem of bycatch of, of dolphins and the like, and what needs to be done about it? Well, the scale of the problem is big. Um, so big in the Baltic, for example, that there's only 400 harbor porpoises left. Any harbor porpoise you catch now as bycatch is one too many because it could mean the end of the whole population. In the uh, Bay of Biscay, 
Um, it's a lot of uh, dolphin bycatch. They are not in that bad a situation yet as uh, in terms of population. But the population is already being impacted because of the high levels of bycatch that have been rising over the past years. And as I said um, um, last year, um, it was assessed about 11,000 were caught by caught. Uh, not all of them uh, uh, washed up on the beach. This winter, um, uh, 1,400 uh, dolphins were washed up on the on the on the beaches um, in the Bay of Biscay, despite. Uh, the COVID um, uh, possibly having reduced uh, the activity there. Um, it's not quite clear from the uh, data if indeed the activity was so much reduced. Um, the way what we need to do now is first and foremost impose emergency measures because there's uh, many different member states uh, fishing there. It's the trolling and the gillnetting that, that are causing the problems, um, but it is um, so there needs to be a joint effort of several member states. That always takes a lot of time. If we now impose emergency measures to have a stop during the winter where most bycatch takes place, um, and then that allows the time to uh, gather data on where we should close areas in order to avoid the largest uh, amounts of bycatches, and, uh, at the, um, and then close those areas later on. At the okay. same time, uh, we should also um, look at the amount of capacity, amount of vessels simply out there. There's hundreds and thousands of kilometers of nets in the Bay of Biscay. It's hard to avoid them being a dolphin. So should they all be there? Because of course, if you just close areas, then you get displacement as Daniel already pointed out earlier. So perhaps we just have to accept that not everybody can fish there, all these vessels. But again, that will take time to get to that agreement. Why well, those things are being watched? I think emergency closures during the winter are very necessary because it's clear that just pingers alone, which is now uh, suggested by France, will not do the job with dolphins. They're not very effective. Thank you very much. Well, Bernard, there's a, I think in, in the biodiversity strategy, it says bycatch of dolphins must be reduced or eliminated. Um, Monica there yes. is calling for emergency measures, a closure of the fishing grounds in the Bay of Biscay, for example, for a couple of months a year at the, the peak time. Is that something you, you endorse? Um, first of all, I think it's completely unacceptable um, in, in our days uh, that we as humans allow ourselves to bring a, you know, a species, a mammal species, to the brink of extinction. Uh, as is happening in especially in the Baltic Sea and I'm very concerned also about the the dolphins in the in the uh, in the western waters in the Bay of Biscay and other western waters um, because even there you the 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 rate of uh, of bycatches and of uh, casualties you have uh, seems to be at a threshold that may endanger the whole stock actually yeah if you have mammals that are reproducing slowly and you you kill you know a certain even a percentage that looks low you're basically risking destroying the whole the whole population. In the Baltic, this is already almost happening now. So indeed, um, we will look at that very seriously. Um, today, we'll have received scientific advice on that. We asked for specific scientific advice to see whether we actually have grounds to take emergency measures and can actually legally justify them. Um, in the Baltic Sea, I think this is probably a way forward because member states have been extremely slow in uh, in taking measures jointly, which they should have done under the um, environmental legislation. In the Bay of Biscay, we have to see whether it it, it is at this point, um, but I wouldn't exclude anything at this point. Uh, I think it's very clear that this is something we have to take very, very seriously. And um, again, the ultimate, as, as Monica says, the ultimate responsibility is on managers on the ground, is on the countries. They have to, and to some extent they do, but they have to do more. They have to do more. It's, it's very important. And it's, it's important that this is understood. Huh? So this is not only something that can be imposed by Brussels. We can perhaps take emergency measures and they last for six months, and then we need to find a permanent solution. And so I think it's very important that these things are raised with the right level of urgency at, at uh, where the problem exists. By the way, I don't think it's only fishermen. Huh? If I speak to the people who actually down on the ground, it's it's many boats. Huh? So dolphins apparently are hit by recreational boats, by commercial ships, by, by freighters. So it's a real problem that we need to address in a, in a more comprehensive way as well. But for sure, I agree that at the moment the situation is rather rather boring, and, and we have to do something about it. Not perhaps uh, an issue with many easy solutions, because I take it 
I won't ask Daniel Victor because I'm sure he'll just simply agree, but uh, it's not as though anyone in the fishing industry wants to kill a dolphin. Um, the, the, uh, it's it's uh, just unfortunate. Look, I just, uh, we're coming to the end of the program, so there's two questions I just want to put to you too quickly. The first is, um, Bernard, you, you've argued that uh, you know, member states recognize now that uh, biodiversity is really important and if we don't take action immediately, then we are going to perhaps pass the point of no return. But on the other hand, the COVID uh, virus problem means that you know, money, everyone's looking for jobs and, the, and, and, and wants to see a resurgence in the economy. And as soon as someone says, well, this is going to cost, uh, cost jobs or money should be used for something else, no, that's going to be the biggest political distraction, is it not? Listen, I mean, we are all we are all in this crisis in, in 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 different ways, and and we have taken very decisive action to to support the European fishing industry with you know a a package that is quite substantial and that 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 was adopted very quickly that can be applied right now, and actually I know from some countries that they are trying to go back to normality now and they try to phase out already these aids. So this is a big challenge, and I think Europe is really has really tried and has been helpful in mastering it. Um, interestingly, the immediate effect of the crisis, of course, is as Monica suggests that uh, if there are fewer boats going out in the first place, that is that is a, a respite also for the fish stocks, right? So the, the the biological effect of it, irrespective of 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 course the the, the economic damage, but the biological effect of it is is, is a good one. Now we have to make sure that's our responsibility as well is that our European fishermen and women and especially the small scale fishermen are not thrown out of business because of something they're not responsible for. I think that's that's important and, and that what, that's what we have tried to do. Uh, and at the same time, we must make sure and that's politically important and that's our responsibility as well, that we don't let up on our sustainability targets. So we, we one doesn't exclude the other, right? We need to help where help is needed but then, of course, it doesn't mean that we can loosen our standards because the standards, keeping the standards really high means also in the long term, not only a better environment, but better revenues as well for the, for the fishing industry. Thank you. Right, and this is my last question. All three of you, you only have a, you know, less than a minute for each of you to, to answer. And it's simply this, this is a 10 year strategy. Um, it's about biodiversity, but of course, you know, we're looking at the, here at the, the fisheries industry too. So very simply, by 2030, will we be catching more fish and landing more fish from European waters? Uh, let's not go into Brexit. Uh, more fish in European waters or fewer fish? Monica, more fish or fewer fish? If we get it in right, the European... should be bigger. Well, I, I really wish you wouldn't focus just on the fish in the sea because that is not the issue here. They're part of an ecosystem and, and it needs to be healthy and thriving. And of course, therefore, we need um, uh, more fish in the sea, less pollution, a transition to low impact fisheries um, and uh, human activities must support the restoration of a thriving uh, marine ecosystem. We've all spelled this out in the Blue Manifesto, where we clearly say how 2030 should look like. And we actually think this biodiversity strategy is a first step towards that blue future. So I uh, hope, sincerely hope, member states will see the light as well as will all the stakeholders involved and that we will get there. Spoken like a true environmentalist. Thank you very much. Uh, Daniel, more fish or fewer fish being caught in 2030? I hope more. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I, I think that's a really good trend uh, from the last uh, years and even decades. Uh, so I, I think in the future, we're gonna have uh, more fish, more quality waters, more um, um, uh, the oceans and the seas will be more healthy, but. I think we should look at other parts of the world, not the European Union. I think we're doing uh, great in, the, uh, in, in our region. Of course, everything can be improved, but uh, I think we're going to have uh, more fish stocks, thriving fish stocks for the future and for our kids and for all the tourists that I hope they will come soon to the south of uh, Europe. But I read a tweet yesterday from uh, an FAO official and he said, we need to better communicate the importance of fisheries for food security and livelihoods and change the narrative about generalized impacts of the fishing sector on the environment, which by the way is heavily regulated. So uh, I, I think that the, the Commission and the European Union should focus on win-win solutions that incentivize the adoption of measures that are productive, that focus on producing more and more sustainable, and uh, at the same time contributing to biodiversity, but not just ban fish because 
that is not the way forward. Okay, thank you. Um, Bernhard, thank you. Um, one issue, you touched upon it earlier on, um, and it's the Mediterranean. We haven't got time to go into it. It's still said to be the most overfished sea in the world, so I hope we'll come back to that in a, in a future New Deal debate. But the, the question, you know, 2030, healthy biodiversity, healthy ecosystems, will we be catching more fish or fewer fish? I don't think more. I don't think more. I think globally and maybe also in Europe, fisheries, capture fisheries are plateauing out. Um, I agree with Daniel that seafood is has a, a much and by orders of magnitude lower carbon footprint than other forms of uh, than animal production, basically. So it's really important that we that we if if we want to to eat and to make available to human population protein from 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 seafood. I think the way forward is, is farmed seafood a lot. Eh? And we can see across across the continents and in Asia how that, that is taking off. Eh? Uh, again, that needs to be sustainable, of course, but there are ways that, that this can be done. Uh, I'm very worried about the impact of climate change. So I'm seeing already uh, fish stocks moving away or just dwindling away, basically, in, in our waters. That's happening. Yeah? The food sources are disappearing, water is getting too warm, acidification. These are really big problems. I, I think by 2030, I don't want to make a guess. I, I think you may see, not on account of fishing not so much, but on account of the climate and the, the global warming, we may see uh, developments that are we don't want to see. And perhaps we don't want to imagine, but we have to face, I think. Thank you very much. Now, Bernhard, you, you mentioned uh, aquaculture as being perhaps the, um, the, the most promising uh, future. And indeed, uh, I think it's been the fastest growing food production method across the world for the past 20 or 30 years. And we debated it in the last New Deal discussion just last week. And anyone who wants to watch that can, can find it on YouTube because Europe is being left behind by comparison to the rest of the world where uh, aquaculture is expanding very rapidly indeed. Now, I want at this moment to, to thank our participants for the debate. That's uh, Bernhard Priest, the current director of DG Mari uh, with the European Commission. Uh, Daniel Bosses for the Europe, Europesh, the voice of the European fishing industry, and Monica Webeck, the executive director of Seas at Risk. Uh, as I always say, um, the repeat of this program is available for those who've registered, I'm told, by pressing a button on the right hand side. But being techno technologically backward myself, I either can't see the button or uh, <laughs> either, it's not, either it's not there or it's there, and I simply can't see it. Uh, and this debate will be available on YouTube from tomorrow afternoon. Now, our three participants, oh, and by the way, uh, this whole debate has been brought to you. Thank you uh, to Wood Pedersen Public Affairs Consultancy in Brussels. Um, thank you very much for the debates you've sponsored so far. I hope you'll carry on for a bit longer. Um, I'm very pleased that our participants have agreed to, to stay on for a bit longer to look at some of the questions that have been sent to us during the course of the uh, last hour. Um, so if anyone wishes to make a cup of coffee and come back and, and listen to this, this is the, the more informal side. So you can all relax. Um, um, and I see we still have more than 100 people currently watching, which is not bad for, for a, lunchtime, lun a, lunch, a lunchtime debate where we don't even have to provide sandwiches. Now, um, first, let, let's see. I've got a question here from... Uh, um, Rebecca Hubbard. Oh, Rebecca's been on before um, from uh, um, Our Fish, environmental NGO Our Fish, and Vera Koho um, from Oceana, who notes that, and I quote, the 2019 IBIS report, I hope you know what IPES report is because uh, I don't, still identifies fishing, not warming or pollution, as the biggest stress on the world's oceans. So despite what you're saying, Bernard, and do tell us what this report is, you know, it is, it is the fishing industry that's the real problem. You're suggesting it is actually going to be climate. What is, what is this report, by the way? This is IPPC I, or something, or the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, or some, some part of that body? It's the uh, UN... It's the, uh, industry report? it's the UN report uh, that came out uh, uh, last year assessing uh, global biodiversity. And it mm. indicates that since the 70s until now, fishes has been the largest threat 
no doubt in the coming years, climate change will take over. I, I, I agree mm. there with uh, Bernard. But I also want to point out that uh, this report really uh, emphasizes uh, the biodiversity decline because uh, Daniel said earlier that, you know, show me which species is not there anymore in the in the in the seas. Well, I'm I'm I am a biologist, but I haven't done the research. But I do know that even the European Environment Agency that came out with the state of the uh, European Environment uh, Report uh, uh, last year highlighted the detrimental uh, state of the European seas. So mm -hmm. it, to me, it sounds a bit after this report coming out, almost as if you would be, you know, you're a, a biodiversity decline denier, like there are climate deniers. You cannot do that, Daniel. I mean, there's massive mm -hmm. and massive scientific reports all showing mass decline in biodiversity you cannot then just say i don't believe it or or, or you it, it would be like saying i don't believe uh, the climate is uh, getting so bad it you can't do that I, I would suggest you first have a look at the report and then we talk again i would really thank like you, to discuss this a bit further. No, thank, you. thank you for the suggestion i actually read the report and we reacted publicly as as your fresh to this ipv's uh, report it was a uh, really uh, I, I think they didn't even consider consulting with FAO at the time. They were saying that 30% or 30 or 40% of the fish that we consume is coming from illegal sources, that they didn't even check if this was true. Then, of course, they said that 90% of the fish stocks are even are either overfished or, uh, or fully exploited, which is a bad thing. So they're mixing legal and sustainable fishing with, uh, with, uh, with overexploitation. So we didn't agree with the report, and yes, we're looking at the science. I can actually, uh, I can do the research for you according to IUCN, which are normally uh, we also have our doubts about the reports from from this body because normally they are really outdated. In the EU, and this was from 2015, in the EU, out of 1,000 species analyzed, only 15 are critically endangered. I don't think this. Is, I'm not saying that this is good news, but I'm saying that out of 1,000 only 15 are critically endangered and mostly there are few shark species, not commercial shark species, few shark species. And of course, uh, we have really good regulations in the European Union to protect sharks. Tell me, I won't even go into the issue about Mako sharks and then, you know, because I, I was at the last ICAC conference in Parma where the European Commission um, put forward proposals for trying to, to try and restrict the bycatch of, of mako sharks, which are severely threatened. Um, I think I may have said this before on, on one of these debates. You know, it, it's an astonishing figure when you're told at a conference that even if even if no more mako sharks are caught at all, it will be until the year 2070 before stocks recover. I mean, it just it, you know, it's. So sharks are very difficult. Anyway, there we are. That's my that's my diversion. I'm glad it's the glad it's the um, relaxed end of the program session. There's a question here about MPAs again, um, marine protected areas, and the lack of enforcement. I suppose, um, Bernhard, we've been looking about what we need to do about expanding MPAs. But I mean, you over the last few years must have been talking to member states about you know, why aren't you enforcing the ones that are declared? So wh what excuses have they been coming up with? Indeed, yeah. So, absolutely right. This is a problem. It's a problem. Eh? Um, as I said, the biodiversity strategy sets out a path how to address the problem, and we need to really do the kind of things that are that I already spelled out and that are in there. It's it's very important. But if you take, for example, the example of the Dogger Bank, right? So a big area in the North Sea that is very shallow that has a lot of biodiversity that we really need to protect properly. This has been going on for ten years at least. Right. And member states who are responsible in the first place. Right. So this is not Brussels that decrees. That is Germany, Britain, Denmark, Netherlands. They all have a stake there. Right. So they have been discussing internally and then they need to agree amongst each other how to do that. That that is the problem. So I think going forward, we really have to think a little bit outside the box and, and see how we can overcome that conundrum of, uh, you know, waiting for an initiative of individual member countries that, that need to find consensus and then the consensus is probably the, the lowest common denominator. 
we, we are in this process right now. I'm, I'm speaking with, with the Netherlands, who are in charge of, of the coalition of member states that uh, try to solve that problem of the, of the dollar bank. But it's it's clear that you know more ambition is needed and 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 more more management and and, and more also restrictions are probably needed in in, in in that. So this this is something that uh, that we with the current instruments we have we are at the end of the cycle, right? We can approve what they submit to us, or we cannot approve it if it's not supported by the science. Uh, but but we need to think I think a bit more about whether there will not come a point of time when. Europe needs to be able to take initiatives in that in that area. Oh, well, right. Well, yes, Europe needs more power. Uh, but but you you're a former me former member of European Parliament, so you I should ask you what do you think about that idea? <laughs> oh, I'm, well, I'm afraid I'm, uh, I just like to see environmental improvements carried out. So I tend to you know, cl clutch at whatever instrument is available. And if, if 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 I was still a member of the European Parliament, if my country was still a member of the European Union, then I would be saying, well, if if if, if, if member states are not going to do what they've signed up to do, then you know, can we find some new legal measure to, to force them to do so? Because, you know, in theory, which, what, which may well be the end right of the story to do. for now, but, you know. Yeah, um, let me throw that one at Monica, though, because um, you've been, you know, your, your NGO and other environmental NGOs have been saying the marine protected areas need to be properly protected and, and, and rules enforced. You've therefore been engaging with member states. I mean, what do they say when, you, when you're campaigning and, and, and uh, and saying, you know, this is only paper protection. It's a designated area, but nothing's being done to stop bad activities within it. Oh, well, we, we have had um, uh, massive problems uh, explaining them basically what is in the Habitat Directive, explaining them that actually uh, fisheries is a measure what you have to uh, uh, take. But when we are showing them with legal experts um, what is in the Habitat Directive and that actually they are obliged within um, a marine protected areas uh, to take fisheries measures. Um, and, in, and in the UK, it's a very good example. One of our members, the Marine Conservation Society, has been very active in the UK and has been very successful in explaining this. And ever since, uh, the UK has changed the governance system for marine protected areas, including um, because before it was just uh, fisheries managers that looked at marine protected areas and they had a bit of a hard time to accept the idea that perhaps there needed to be some fisheries measures in order to make these marine protected areas work. Um, and and uh, so the governance has changed and that has been massively successful and now a lot of dredging has been stopped in marine protected areas in uh, the UK. And Daniel, I really wanted to come back to you when you said you know, these huge areas or on the other side of the world, I forgot where, they have really shown they are not working at all. I wonder if there have been the right measures, because I remember still years back, end of the 90s, in the Netherlands, uh, um, it was clear that there was a place box where you were not supposed to fish for place, and still there was no recovery, so it doesn't work, marine protected area. But they were not looking at uh, whether it was the right size, uh, whether it was well enforced, what the measures were exactly. So I really want to stress that a marine protected area can only be effective if the right measures for that area are taken there and are being enforced. And that is why I think it's very important that we now have the uh, EMFF and that we need to make sure there is a, uh, an amount, 25% ring fenced indeed, um, for nature protection. That's very important because we need to be able to pay for rangers. And by the way, those rangers could very well be the fishers that have run out of job because of the COVID uh, crisis. They could now become rangers for marine protected areas. For example, I really think the future EMFF can be used to make this shift to low impact fishing, which will be the future for all fisheries and uh, ensuring uh, green jobs on the way. Okay. And the European, the EMFF, by the way, is the European Maritime and Fisheries Fund, um, the money that's available for the, for the fishing industry and for coastal communities uh, and, and, the, and the like. Um, Daniel, here's a question from, uh, directed to you really, from, from Bruna Campos um, from BirdLife. Uh, bottom trawling on reef habitats is much more costly to restore. It will require active restoration. We've lost most of our oyster reefs in Europe. If we were to actively restore 1% of oyster reefs, it would cost 78 billion euros. 
Therefore, bottom trawling is on the long run, um, not allowing bottom trawling is therefore you know, the most sensible thing to do. It's more, it's cost effective. Well, maybe 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 you're not deep. Maybe you're maybe you're not uh, into oysters. No, I'm not very really familiar with the, with the topic. But all I can say is that, that uh, well, we cannot compare the fisheries management that we had uh, 50, 40 years ago with the fisheries management that we have nowadays. We have a lot of science. We have a lot of research. Uh, we have minimized the impact. We are really more selective with uh, with bottom trawling. So a lot of efforts and a lot of progress have been made uh, in the past years. And I, I do agree with, with Bernard now that he, uh, he, uh, he was talking about the case of uh, Dobber Bank. We need to sit down, scientists, governments, the European Commission and the sector together and then find solutions. What we cannot say is like, well, we need to protect 30% of the ocean as if the oceans were all the same. Same as in land, we have forests, we have uh, uh, deserts, uh, desert, sorry, deserts and uh, different uh, um, different biodiversity and different situations across the world in the ocean is the same. So perhaps it's not right and correct to use bottom trawling in a coral reef, which we don't do. We fish in sand areas with bottom trawling. So, and if there's something that needs to be protected, of course we do. And we negotiate uh, with, uh, with their FMOs, with, uh, with the European Union, etc. In NIAC, for instance, Year after year, there's new VMEs, vulnerable uh, marine ecosystems, that are close to fishing. Because we encounter corals, because, uh, you know, it's, it's not the same everywhere. And we mm. cannot judge the oceans and the seas as one single thing. They are different. They have uh, different elements, different species, different animals. It's, it's not, you cannot apply the same tools to the same uh, okay. to, to the condition. Thank you. Bernhard, you want to come in? No, just, 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 just two points, if I may. I mean, you know, we have enough corals, cold water corals, in our waters that are vulnerable to 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 bottom gear, and and that are actually risk being destroyed in some areas. Are, some cases are being destroyed. So there's there's a good case to be made also to be very watchful in our own waters about the effect of bottom gear. Secondly, on the on the thirty percent, you know, we're not saying that thirty percent everywhere. We say that there's enough areas to be protected, worthwhile to be protected in the in European waters to make up 30% of, of, of our waters. That that's 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 for sure in our in our assessment. Whether you know these areas are how many of them are in the Mediterranean, how many are in the Baltic Sea, in the North Sea, in, in, in the Atlantic, that depends on 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 very specific analysis. But but you know it, it's not it's not the same percentage in every country in every in every sea basin. But on the whole, there's enough worthwhile to be protected to, to have 30% of, of, of sea area really protected through marine protected areas, for sure. That's not greenwashing, that is just in our own interest. A question thrown in about um, the support in support of low impact fishing, especially in these protected areas. Daniel, um, Europesh, I say it's the voice of the fishing industry, but you know, I tend to think of it, and you correct me, please, I tend to think of it as the voice of the, of the you know, the large scale, high capitally intensive fishing industry. To what extent do you think you, Europesh represents low impact fishermen too and promotes their interests? Yeah, well, it depends on the definition of low impact. Uh, if we take uh, from different organizations, perhaps it's the gear, it's the size of the vessel. I don't know, for me, low impact is well regulated. That's all that we need. And, Monica, uh, perhaps you've got a different definition. For low impact fishing, low impact yeah. fishing is fishing without impacting a, a, a lot the environment. So without uh, destroying the bottom, without a lot of bycatch. And in that sense, I wanted to get back to Daniel because you say the fishing industry has made improvements and indeed uh, the fishing industry did. Uh, but, but not all issues have been solved. Look at the bycatch of the dolphins, for example. So uh, there's still widespread uh, evidence of non-compliance with the landing obligation, right? with the killing of protected species and, and uh, scientific data, these are now recognized as being undermined uh, by a lack of confidence in the catch uh, data and records. So I think there's still very easy improvement to be achieved immediately actually, um, by looking at those uh, measures that would, would uh, uh, increase um, the problems here. So, um, and, and this is just talking about, uh, um, uh, control and enforcement, and there's many other uh, issues that can be done. I really think 
there have been several uh, or a lot of uh, uh, studies uh, where low impact gear were tried out. You know, uh, scientists came to the fishing industry. We have this um, um, change of gear. Perhaps it will help. Can you uh, help us uh, um, do the research? And they did, and it was all great. But then it was never uh, upscaled to a large implementation uh, in the fishing fleet. And I would be really curious if that is because of uh, a, a lack of uh, a money for changing the gears. Is it because uh, of a sort of uh, uh, um, uh, yeah. lack of uh, interest in innovation, or what is it? I would, I would just, I'm just. This is an open question. Nothing to. I'm just curious. Do you want to respond, uh, Daniel? One, the, the the problem for me is to understand why. What do you mean by low impact fishing? Is it a certain fishing gear that is low impact, or is a certain size of the vessel? No, no. When you're talking it about, is... for instance, I read a report, and the main threats, or the, I would say, the main cost, is uh, is uh, gillnets. But then you mix it with uh, trawlers. But the main problem is gillnets, and is that a low impact uh, fishing gear for you? I mean, should we all fish with uh, gillnets and traps and ports and hooks? And that's it, or because that is, that is no, right. no, no, no. But it has to be well regulated, mitigate as much as we can the impact on the environment, of course. But then uh, we cannot generalize, to, to be honest. Whether the, the the problem with uh, the dolphins, it, well, it's a different one, and uh, is what many call as low impact fishing gear. But as Bernard he said before, and quite rightly, I mean, it's not about the fishing gear. It's like how do you regulate it? How do you use it in a certain area? And that's what you have to look at. What okay, I'm saying uh, is, okay, should very, I very, quick, or very, not? very, very quickly, Monica, please reply. Low impact means uh, uh, less impact, uh, uh, a more selective, less impact on the bottom, etc. For different areas or different kind of fisheries, uh, uh, low impact uh, alternatives are of course different. Uh, for long lining, you can do a lot with just adjusting uh, the hooks, for example, to mitigate uh, bird bycatch. Um, there's, so it depends a lot on where you are fishing and what the impacts are. If there, if you are fishing in an area with lots of dolphins, well, first of all, probably you should not fish there. Uh, but secondly, you should fish there not then with uh, uh, gears that uh, you will make sure you are sure that the bycatch um, um, is increasing. So not with trawlers and not with uh, uh, gill nets. Thank you. So I'm not talking about sizes. I'm talking about impact. Okay. Bernard, um, the question here is saying um, the common agricultural policy is geared to is increasingly geared to paying farmers for public service, not least service to the environment or protection for the environment. And this question here is: Is there a way of revising, I don't know, the EMF or, or, or something to to pay fish to, to reward fishermen for for better practice towards the environment? Has that any any thought been given to that, or do we just? Uh, does it resonate? Yes, of course. Yes, of course. Yeah. I mean, we have a European Maritime and Fisheries Fund, which basically has as its raison d'etre to support the common fisheries policy. Right. So it's a small fund. Um, but the reason why we have the fund is that it should provide and provides measures that allow us to reach the sustainability targets of the common fisheries policy. And 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 in doing so, also provide a living for the fishing, fishermen and fisherwomen, of course more selective gear, uh, also more safe fishing vessels, um, all kind of measures that allow training and innovation. Uh, we used it also, by the way, to help the fishing industry through the crisis now. So ab absolutely. Yeah? So it works differently from the agricultural fund, very differently, actually. We don't have uh, a what is a big part of the of the common agricultural policy, which is market support. Basically, we don't do that. We don't support prices so we don't give subsidies to to support you know the demand or the the, the ring to market products we really try to and we should continue to try to um, have expenditure only for measures that uh, support the objectives of the of the cfp i think that this is this is the right way to go so definitely yeah why why are you speaking uh, the uh, sustainability strategy that the commission adopted last Wednesday talks about um, reducing fishing mortality to or under maximum sustainable yield. 
What do, what do you mean by two or under? Is that is two or under MSY? Is that is that different from the existing policy? No, it's the same. It's the same. So MSY is the upper limit, should be the upper limit. So whenever we know what MSY is, and we know it more and more for more and more fish stocks, maximum sustainable yield, we should make it the limit of fishing pressure, basically. And right. that is what we have tried to do. And when we say that, you know, we have met our 2020 targets and we haven't met it, and we haven't met it in big areas like in the Mediterranean, huh? we have to be open about that. Things are quite quite bad there, actually, in terms of MSY. But where we have met it, this is this is the limit. So we are just reiterating here in this in this biodiversity strategy that this needs to be absolutely the cornerstone of of, of fisheries management. Now, and is, it is it is that if you do that over the years, if you do that over ten years, right, and and you do it every year, and you try to approximate more and more towards MSY, acknowledging that you don't get there uh, for every stock and every fish stock at the same time, then you generate also the the economic benefit and the social benefit and the ecological benefit of it. Now, my understanding is that the uh, you know the existing common fisheries policy, which was adopted in 2013, which sets maximum sustainable yield as the target, basically stops overfishing. Um, so we're no longer driving fish stocks into extinction. We have stability, but in practice, over the last 10 years, fish stocks have you know are 50 percent higher, the commercial fish stocks, than they were uh, 10 years ago. Is, is that that's the case? And does that mean we're? I mean, is that a deliberate policy that we're rebuilding the biomass? The, the weight of fish in the sea. So, so the logic is if you fish at the sustainable level, so if the fishing effort you put in, the fishing pressure you exercise is sustainable, then you you start enabling the fish stocks to recuperate to levels that where they what we call the biomass, the size of the fish stock, how many fish are in the sea is also at the same sustainable level. Now I'm not going to tell you and, and Monica will make that point. I'm not going to tell you that this is the, the case for each and every fish stock, right? We still have disasters happening and we have them in the Baltic Sea where we had the cod stock completely collapsing uh, for reasons that are quite diverse. Uh, we had it in, in the western waters where we have a cod stock uh, collapsing. Um, so we still have situations few but we have them and they're very serious where we really have to do firefighting basically and, and try to recover as much as we can and that's, that's very hard, that's very hard. By the way, these are these are issues where fisheries are a big, a big, a big issue, but also climate change is a big issue. So some of the and, and pollution is a big issue. That's what I said at the beginning, right? So where we have problems, we have them because there's accumulation of, of causes and problems that make things worse. OK, well, we're, we're running out of time here, and um, I think this is probably a good point on which to finish because we are talking about uh, biodiversity and at least when it comes to commercial fish stocks in the in the Atlantic. Or, the Atlantic waters around the European Union, things are in a much state, better state than they have been, uh, they were 10 years ago. And I hope the biodiversity strategy setting out targets for, for 2030 delivers on that. And we can look back in a decade's time at improvement across a wide range of species and a much healthier ecosystem. So thank you very much for, for, for watching this uh, webinar, this Blue Deal debate. Um, I want to thank very much Ruud Pedersen Public Affairs in, in Brussels for uh, making this event possible. And I want to thank our speakers. I want to wish my very best to, to uh, Bernard Priest, the current director of, uh, current director general of DG Mary, the Commission's Fishing Division. I want to thank, thank uh, Daniel uh, Voses, uh, the managing director of Europesh, the voice of the fishing industry. Um, no doubt you may be back on again, Daniel, because uh, unless you can find someone else to, to speak up valiantly on behalf of, of the fishing industry when it's under pressure. And uh, we have uh, Monica Verbeek, Executive Director of uh, Seas at Risk, all who have joined me today for this webinar. Now, the next one, the next one is supposed to be on Tuesday, June the 9th. I don't know yet what the subject will be. Frankly, we're spoiled for choice. It rather depends on, on uh, who is available to, to join us. So, so keep a watch out. Uh, this webinar is available on YouTube as from tomorrow. Um, so may wish to, to watch it again. Uh, thank you all. Thank you to our participants for joining us. Thank you for, for watching. Um, hope you'll register for future Blue Deal debates. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Take care.